Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. And thank you, Ed. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, everybody. Let's have some fun. Um, you know, I, I want to reason I really love Bob Cohn. We don't, you're not supposed to talk about another public age. I want to talk about Bob for a minute. Bob used to be at Wired Magazine years ago. We're not supposed to talk about Wired at the Atlantic. But the Atlantic is so much better now. Than, I mean, we, but we're doing all the kind of cool stuff that Wired used to do. So I just want to say, hey, you brought this here. This is cool. It's about the future. You know, I was thinking last night about this session today and the fact, you know, June 7th, 2017, Ed, happy birthday. Uh, on June 7th, 1917, what would this forum have been about? We would have been about uh, you know, uh, automobiles. We would have been about the beginning of flying. We would have about, been about uh, how science had impacted processes and manufacturing and you know, brought uh, kind, you know, new things to industry. So this kind of forum would have been relevant 100 years ago. Very different topics. Perhaps things have sped up, but it's useful to take a look. And then ask a question on Ed's birthday in 2027, because you know Microsoft is trying to end death. So he may, in fact, uh, be around by then. Uh, uh, at that time, and, and at that time, I think one of the questions is, what will we have had to do? What are some of the hard choices? Uh, when you begin thinking about technological innovation, where we want to go, some of it could be bad, some of it could be good. We have three outstanding people here on different dimensions of this question. And you know, I was talking to you guys in the back room about whether or not DC has a kind of do good problem, like we always want to have, I mean, even Ed did it, where we're, we're trying to solve society's problems. And I guess what I want to start out is, is that the right kind of cloak to put on this as you begin thinking about what you're trying to make a buck on, right? You're invest. you're not trying to save the world, right? You're trying to say, how can I go out, and you are, you're like really the best person on this panel. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm interested in, in, in the question of the, the gap between how Washington thinks about technology and innovation and really what's going on out there. And so what do you think, Dana, the, the, the real ingredients are that are necessary to have a rich, robust innovation environment? Uh, well, there's a, a few things. One, um, I do think that you can do well by doing good or do good by doing well. Um, Darn it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't think, you know, we're not an impact fund for sure. We yeah. don't have a double bottom line. But we do, you know, venture capital is responsible for creating the majority of new jobs in this country on an annual basis. And definitely mm -hmm. if you look back at, you know, the Fortune 500 or the Atlantic 500, <laughs> the Wired magazines, the companies that really have created the jobs over the past um, two decades have all been venture backed. So that's really what I look at. I think what we're struggling with now is, as a country, is sort of this reallocation of jobs. And almost, you know, what I've been seeing is what's old is new again, that actually your comments from 1917, you know, a lot of what I'm investing in these days is manufacturing tech. Totally different manufacturing tech. One of my companies is printing metals, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the past. And currently the bulk of the way that's created today is via CNC machining. That's a 3D machining. printing kind of thing? 3D, 3, yeah. D, 3D printing at scale, production volumes um, can be achieved through desktop metals printer. Uh, that otherwise is not really uh, possible other than through CNC machining and other um, sort of more, to, more conventional mechanisms that were developed in 1917, right? Um, so I think what we're seeing now is just the squaring of, you know, how do we, or an attempt to square, how do we redistribute jobs and, and advance the country at the same time? And that's the constant struggle. Do you that we see feel. that as your burden of redistributing jobs, or do you see? what you're doing in 3D printing, what can be, I mean, like, like there's a big social equation there, which right. is different than, okay, I'm 3D printing metals, and you see opportunities there. I'm just sort of interested in what the uh, hurdles are to you as you're, you know, what, what challenges do you have as you just think about, you know, scaling and, and making that a profitable line? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, so no, I'm a capitalist at the end of the day, and I do believe in capital markets and the, the way they sort themselves out over time, and I can only affect it one investment at a time. Um, so no, I don't see it as my personal burden, but I do think it really does, you know, the, I believe in the force of the capital markets, and if you follow progress that uh, redistribution will happen. I mean, we are a, a, a very resilient country, and and we figured mm -hmm. these things out over time. Sheen, you're in the virtual reality arena. Uh, how do you think about, I mean, you're, you're, one, I'd be interested in like how in the hell you got into this, but uh, uh, how, how, how has the VR uh, become one of the pathways you think is one of the future and, and mm -hmm. just take us down that road in a virtual way, if you will? Absolutely. Well, I got into it from the architecture world. I was in architecture and uh, discovered VR sort of organically through that uh, about three years ago. Um, 
And I mean, it's a new medium. So when I, when I look at VR, I also think about AR as sort of one of the same equation. But why don't you just take us in? So when you mm -hmm. say you're an architecture, and you know, when you go into this arena, tell, take us into a journey of, of that architectural build out. Describe for yeah. people if they were wearing one of your headsets, what they'd be seeing. Yeah, absolutely. So we work with architects and construction firms to walk through a building before it's built. So every new building that goes up now is built in 3D first. There's architects at their machines building this model. And we take that model and allow someone to put on goggles and go through and actually understand the layout of a space. For example, if you were designing a hospital, being able actually to go through and say, as the client, mm -hmm. oh, I see that literally this wing, this entire segment's going to go up here. Or that I'm, the nurse is going to be able to do a rotation here. Or the doctor's going to be able to walk here. Being able to understand that before it's actually built is tremendously valuable for the construction process and can save a lot of costs down the line. People aren't surprised when they walk into the real thing and say, like, oh, this is, this is what we were talking about at the design stage. So that's where we're using VR right now. I, I, I like VR in this context because it's a tool. It's not a gimmick. And I think that VR is walking that line right now where we see it everywhere. And a lot of times, I think it edges towards the gimmick. And it edges towards something that's very superficial. And, and, I'm excited and about in, that. in your world, if you're going to, say, build the new Pentagon, uh, I know somebody's here from the Pentagon, and you're going to build a new Pentagon and, and build this out, maybe we can have a smaller Pentagon, perhaps, a more efficient one. Um, it, 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 does your system, does it have interactivity if Bob Cohn's in the hallway and he's actually checking out you know, the publications division of the Pentagon? Is there an interactivity with your, your virtual reality system? There is. You can, you can explore it. You can essentially go where you want to go in virtual reality and really understand the progression of a space, which really matters um, if you are designing any building, essentially how the flow is and how people can move through it. You can adjust like time of day. You can adjust essentially all the elements of a building design before it's actually built. So if you owned a magazine like The Atlantic and you were going to kind of give people, can you give people virtual reality experiences and stories? I mean, I'm just sort of interested, mm -hmm. what would you do in, say, 10 years when you're bored with buildings? That's a good question. I think that what we're seeing is right now, so the technology today is really in a 2D plane. If, if you're on your iPhone, that is a, that is a feed. You're looking at a feed. Um, and we talk about there's this ride of, rise of spatial technology, where now all of this technology coming out is starting to think about how it interacts with the space around you. Apple's announcements earlier this week around how your devices actually measure space around you. We actually see ourselves as a bit of a metaphor for that. We exist. Uh, doing the built environment, but over time that could really apply to things smaller than buildings. Mm -hmm. It could apply to people interacting with their kitchen table. It could apply to people interacting with um, their car. You know, Maria Rose, I want to uh, you, you, you tell have you tell the audience your story about how you're solving the food shortage issue and creating efficiencies. But what, one of the ways I want to you know, after you you know get into that is is in, as an innovator. Do you spend any time thinking about the underlying science? You walk around and see the mosquito. Uh, have you ever seen the mosquito thing upstairs? You know, you go look that. That's pretty cool. You know, basically, it's not all about mosquitoes. It's actually looking at the viruses that are transferring through the system. Um, I definitely, Ed, want to basically get a loner on the, uh, the little bubble with the plant. I have problems talking to plants, and I think I'd be better if I could uh, communicate with plants. But, but you know, I think. Uh, these things, whether they're relevant to life or not, they have underlying science pieces to it. And I'm interested, as you as an innovator who have connected folks, whether that's something you think about is the underlying science of what you do with that creates opportunity, or do you feel like you can just build on top uh, and then solve the world's food distribution problems? So first off, I'm pre-med, so all the science all the time. Ah, got <laughs> All it. the science. So to explain what we do, Means is a nonprofit communications platform for emergency food providers and their donors. So, in plain spoken English, when grocery stores, restaurants, caterers, events like this have extra food, all they have to do is hop on their phone or on their laptop and tell us what they've got and when they need it gone by. And then we send free em email and or text alerts to every soup kitchen, homeless shelter, food pantry, domestic violence safe haven in the region, and we're able to match them up very, very quickly. We've recovered more than 250,000 pounds of food in a network built across 48 states, and we do it on between four and $7,000 a month. So that's what we do. And, and yeah. tell them how you got the spark of this idea on that cold day. Yes, so yeah. I, I mentioned that I'm pre-med, so I'm a junior at American University, and I promise I'm also a capitalist. Yeah. <laughs> I am also a capitalist. We'll be both. <laughs> you still are the best person on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of doing good. 
Maybe. <laughs> All right. Keep right. that Monica. <laughs> Don't give it up. Don't give it up. Okay. So I have been working in food pantries since I was about five years old. I'm from rural Iowa. And by the time I was, you know, 12, 13, I was really starting to recognize that we had this fundamental disconnect where we would get too much food as the food pantry and struggle to get it out to the people who needed it and struggle to talk to our neighboring agencies and say, hey, do you need this? Because we've got too much and we're going to have to toss it. Mm. We had a very kind person in our community who didn't ask us first give us 10,000 boxes of macaroni and cheese. My town has like 10,000 cows <laughs> and like I think 8,000 people. <laughs> we, we couldn't move that at all. And we ended up throwing a lot of it away. And because I was among the youngest volunteers, I always volunteered to go, through, to go throw it away because the walkway was super icy. And I never wanted any of the older volunteers to fall. So I would just go throw it away, which meant I really understood the volume of waste that we had because I was the one stuck tossing it in the dumpster. Mm -hmm. And I thought, because I am from rural Iowa, I assumed that someone had built this network and we just weren't a part of it. You know, someone has to have built this. We just were not on it because, you know, we're in rural Iowa. And it turned out that no one had built a network mm. of this capacity. So I sat there in eighth grade and was like, well, OK, guess we're doing it. So flash forward, I'm now 21 years old. Most of our staff are teenagers are in their early 20s. And we've built this, this network using really advanced tech. We, we use Twilio. We're on Ruby Rails. Our tech, staff is, tech stack is AWS, et cetera. We've, we've really tried to pair a market-based solution with really strong and undeniable need. Mm. So how, what is the, um, it's such fascinating, so, and, and, and thank you um, for countries, I'm just joking, you're all wonderful uh, panelists, but, but I am interested in the, in the kind of, what are your challenges? What are the challenges for another young person or another innovator out there? I mean, part of this is, I mean, all of you are doing well, and I often wish I had three other people that have tried, tried really hard and failed. They failed because, you know, they didn't have capital financing or the right tools weren't available or there's discrimination in the system and they weren't given a fair shot. I'm interested in what you see as some of the barriers to your uh, peers, if you will, uh, that have had, had, that have tried to do the, you know, some of these things but are, but are problems. What are the, what are the speed bumps? I mean, um, entrepreneurs, fail every day. Even, you know, entrepreneurs we've invested in, we fail every day. And that's the nature of our business. One in um, 10 really becomes a huge hit. You know, the venture economics work out. The one in 10 might become a huge hit. You know, we, we basically try to get our capital back on a mid-set of those. And then, you know, two or three of them are all out failures. And, you know, that's what I think is great about the model and the great about the culture of the United States. Like, we accept that. And there's, you know, it's not worth doing if it if, um, if there's not some risk of failure in there, and that that's almost celebrated. And a lot of entrepreneurs that we've backed, you know, time and time again, um, might have had a failure or two in their lives. And um, you build resilience, you build understanding, you build expertise. Mm. Um, and we do celebrate first-time entrepreneurs, too, for that reason. You don't have to be complete you know, expert in, you know, Do you um, ever go back and look farming. at somebody else's failures or even your own failures and say, hey, maybe this needs a shot again? Mark Andreessen, yeah. I, I read his tweets religiously, and, you know, he said a while back that the best ideas that are, that are a hit today were actually failures yesterday, that most of the things we think are cool and new were, were things left on the oh, table. Oh, completely. You know, I mean, the ago. internet bubble of, you know, 2000, a lot of the problems with those businesses that failed were that, you know, there were only 50 million people online at that time. Time um, and we didn't have a smartphone. We right. didn't have, you know, really what has what has brought most of both, you know, consumer, um, social media technology to light over the past ten years has been the smartphone more than the internet. You know, it's the coupling of those two for sure. So trying things that you know we wish had been brought online, everyone rushed like the gold rush in 2000 to, you know, create this e-commerce site. Uh, that's selling X, Y, or Z, and there just weren't enough, you know, the market just wasn't big enough, and there weren't enough people with these edge devices that can access mm -hmm. the product. Jane? Like, your, 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 your product wouldn't work today probably without sort of mobile notifications, I'm guessing. If yeah, you really it wouldn't be as effective, yeah. 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 Shane? On the heels of that, too, I think for us, it's it sort of all boils down to timing, at least for our early days. There was a period we started in 2014, 
uh, started running out of our own money, and then Facebook acquired Oculus, like right at that period. And like we would have gone right into the ground if that hadn't happened because there wasn't a validation of the market yet. And uh, we we saw great companies before us um, in the like immersive real time space that had great ideas and great technology, but uh, the market wasn't quite there. And sort of your point, it's a lot of that comes down to timing, at least as the company is just starting to get its foothold and, and figure out <laughs> what it's doing next. Uh, Maria Rose, just one of the things we talk a lot about, you know, and, and, and too much, I'm going to get too, too far down that way, is a gap between available tech opportunities out there and what's the pipeline of talent in the country. Um, do you guys feel that in, in, in the businesses you're looking at? You mean availability of tech talent? Well, I mean, in, in terms of just far more openings, I mean, you have, have talent in the United States, so this sort of big gap. And I'm just interested, from a from a you know younger person's perspective out there innovating, is that on your radar? Is that on your dashboard? It's on DC's dashboard. I just don't know if it's really on the dashboard of real innovators. Yeah, real I mean, and I think that's why you see this, you know, Silicon Valley, you know, entrepreneurs going to Silicon Valley, not just because they'll be able to find capital there, but because you'll be able to hire people there that are trained and like. No technology, and I think that's a that's something that we've seen start to change. New York's a big hub of activity. Boston's always been a big hub of activity. We've made a lot of our returns off of this area, by the way, as well. Although we're duly based in Menlo Park and here, mm -hmm. um, our, our returns on the east and west coast are actually neck and neck. So oh, interesting. Um, we, you know, we firmly believe in sort of um, opportunity sort of nationwide, but there is this sort of hiring challenge, sort of getting out, you know, escape velocity. Sometimes you're limited by being able to find that, you know, next level CTO, or you finally need a CMO, a chief marketing officer, and you're going to have to, you know, move them from some other area of the country. It adds roadblocks and it decreases the time that you otherwise need. That's the advantage that startups have is time. Right. And you can do things faster. And if you get slowed down by anything, a bad hire or, you know, that's you know, very... Maria Rose, what would have been probably. the big hurdles for you? So we've seen kind of a twofold part of that. Finding Ruby Rails developers mm -hmm. is challenging, but also finding people who want to do this kind of work and then can't access the training to do it. Interesting. We really see a, a strong underrepresentation of women, of people of color, of low-income folks in tech jobs specifically, right. especially development and actually writing the code. We just joined this partnership with the Washington, D.C. economic partnership called Pathways. They're mm -hmm. providing five full-time scholarships to low-income folks, most of whom are experiencing homelessness, who need to learn how to code. So they're going to teach them full-stack devs, and then we're going to be able to hire them mm. full-time, which is great because we want people with lived experience with hunger working with us on trying to solve it. But to speak to your, 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 your question of the, the barriers, so none of us can run a car, like, like actually. You have to be 25. Like, we can't rent cars. And we, we have some Is that true? Yeah, you have to be 25. It's no awful. <laughs> like, Bob, Bob has kids under 25. You're so thrilled with that, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I see. Okay. <laughs> but there's uh, there's some unique challenges. That's or, fascinating. Or even hotel rooms uh, and we'll we'll before thankfully we're now mostly yeah. over eighteen. <laughs> but we would get things about well you can't rent this hotel room, you're not eighteen and we would be sitting there going, We started the company, we're here to pitch. <laughs> like please uh, just that, let that us have a hotel. Such a great room. article on like just how life is just getting in the way of like really smart. <laughs> like young. we know, we know. Uh, 90% of the teenagers who are here yeah. for a different thing, we really just need to crash so we can pitch tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are some really unique barriers, but there's also some pretty great opportunities because, because we are so young and because so many of us are in college, we can work for basically nothing. We can work at weird hours. It's not strange for us to all do espresso shots at 9.30 p.m. We can kind of run that runway a little bit longer, and that puts us in this kind of unique opportunity. I want to go to the audience in, in, in just a second. Um, one, one of the things I, why, why I, I'm not doing an ad for Microsoft, but I like science fairs, I like innovation fairs, things that come to Washington because DC uh, is looked at as more of a regulator than necessarily. And so you can sort of show DC what's possible out there. Uh, and oftentimes you see these innovators who are just so far ahead, there's a lag effect here in Washington. Now, I don't know, I, I should know, you're, you're an American, are you here local? Mm -hmm. and, and Shane? We're based in New York. You're based in New York. So um, how do you, I mean, does it feel awkward to be in a place that just runs a little bit lagging behind the, the cutting edge of thinking innovation everywhere else in the world? I'm just interested in whether or not you're aware of that gap or not. Yeah, I, yeah. I, if we started our company in Vermont, 
Uh -huh. And I actually, I, I think we would have stayed there if we didn't have to give in-person demos of VR. Um, and I say that because uh, the, it's, we, we were, you're so connected now. And I, I, we were really able to get all business done in a beautiful area of the country, but then we had to travel to, to actually right. give in-person demos. So I think more than ever, we're, I, we're really getting close to a, to a point where uh, sort of besides capital and besides giving in-person demos, you can start sustaining a right. business Right. Real elsewhere. quick, Dana? I'll say, I mean, our fund is $3 billion. We can't build returns on that just in any one city. $3 billion? Yeah, let wow. alone D.C. Um, but what we've seen in D.C. is that there's, there's no lack of quality. The quality of entrepreneurs are on par with, you know, the pinnacle of the West Coast, or we have an office in New York, too. Mm. Um, what, we, what we have seen, though, is that the quantity is not there. So, but there isn't, I wouldn't ca characterize this area as laggard by any means of mm. the word. I would just, you know, there's just fewer of them. But the quality, I mean, we're, we've, like I said, we've been investors in Sourcefire and Opower and Seven and Add This and, um, awesome. yeah, a number of Marie big, Rose? big companies in this area. I mean, I live in my, like, nice little college bubble. Uh. But I honestly don't see us as behind. I think DC is behind in some other ways. Hmm. We're behind in that we have three full service grocery stores in all of Ward 7 and 8, hmm. serving 150,000 people. We're behind in that we have so many people struggling with underemployment. We're behind in a lot of ways, but we're see not. See what I said about Maria Rose? You just know these social things. Good. Uh, <laughs> Getting a degree I in public health, them. man. He's going to fix them. Let's go. We're going to go lightning round questions. So quick, fast question, quick, fast answers, because we're going to have Congressman Hurden just here in a second. Uh, thoughts, reactions, questions? Right here, Paula Stern. You think I all did that by some, you know, magic? I actually don't. Okay, he said, uh, he said reactions, fast, yes. not just questions. Right. Kudos to all of y'all, particularly you and to our host, Microsoft, for commenting on the importance of workforce, uh, homegrown workforce that is diverse. Uh, that message has to get through to everyone. It has been overlooked in all of this discussion, and I say that on behalf of the National Center for Women and in Information Technology. Thank you for that good commercial, Paula. Uh, yes, right here, this gentleman right here. We're going to give you a mic. Millions are watching online right uh, now. Chicken or the egg uh, question. Does the technology show up and then you figure out how to use it? Right. Or do you perceive a need and a bottleneck and then somehow the, uh, you uh, discover or Super push for question. technology? Super uh, question. Shane? Um, we perceived a need. I was, I was building a tool for myself to use with virtual reality. Um, but I, you, I've seen both work. Dana? Uh, it, it's usually always need driven. There's there's a phrase in venture capital, especially seed. It's you can invest earlier, you can invest way too early. And if you find the technology, a lot of technologies are just way ahead of the, their time, including the internet originally. So uh, always things start to happen when there's real needs. Maria Rose, I would say eggs. So that we have the we have the need, we see the need, and then we realize there's a chicken roaming around that we've just never really brought in before. What we like what we've built with means is not especially sophisticated. It's, our security is kind of intense because we have the relocation of domestic violence shelters, but for the most part, we have a pretty simple tech stack. We're not doing anything new in terms of tech. We're just bringing it to a new place and doing something new with it. I would say we're going we're gonna to end in just a moment. I want, I want you to think of it, but I, I would add a just sort of editorial comment that um, one of the really interesting things that we're not seeing here uh, at this Microsoft, I mean, Ed, how many displays are here? Twelve. Twelve. Um, mosquitoes, plants, uh, white space in ag, all of this is great. But there's a fair that Microsoft has often had, which is completely off the record and super cool, that is filled with things on algorithms and lines and biomedical advances that, that are, require such a profound degree. That's interesting about the, the basic science that underlies a lot of uh, these here is, is uh, really interesting to me. And so it, it gets back into the issue. There's a ton of science, ton of innovation that's out there that may, you may not even know the relevance of it yet, that one of the innovators for, you know, a Microsoft or an IBM, a Google somewhere is coming up with something that may in fact uh, connect. And I, and I just want to put that out there because uh, it, going in, I was, it was with Rick, Rick Rashid, your chief science officer, is it total Star Trek not. Uh, would have these things and bring us in. I wouldn't understand most of it, but you could kind of feel that was going to lead to the foundation that would you know, take Maria Rose. That was going to create the innovator that Dana uh, might have had. That might have helped create some algorithm that would make uh, VR work. So there's another dimension here that I think is very important. Please give a massive round of applause to this fantastic <laughs> panel. Maria Rose Belding, Dana Grace, and Shane.
Scranton. Thank you guys very much. Thank you for joining us.